If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 23. And I know this is a very familiar text, but the Lord, yesterday when I went in, uh, Monday I wrote a Revelation sermon to always stay ahead. I try to stay two weeks ahead on that. And so uh, I started this and got the thought and just wrote it through. And I really think uh, this is going to encourage you uh, here tonight. Father, thank you for who you are and what you do. And God, I just thank you for our church. God, thank you for Sunday. What a glorious day we had. And God, we give you the glory for all of that. Thank you for the many guests and the families uh, that were visiting with us. And God, I do pray for Awanas tonight. And God, I pray you bless that ministry, the children, and uh, pray for Brother Marty and the youth. And God, just uh, be with us tonight as we look at your word. And God, I pray that we can have true peace uh, in our lives. All right, if you have a handout, you'll see the peace of God uh, is the title. And three things I want to share with you. Number one, provisional peace. Provisional peace. All right, that, that'll be verses one through three. And number two, personal peace. Personal peace, and that's uh, verse 4. And then the third one is perfect peace. Perfect peace. And uh, I know we cannot be perfect, but we can have perfect peace in our lives. And I will say, it, it will try to elude you, and you've got to work at it to have perfect peace. Uh, but I do believe it is possible. You know, every person that is born is looking for peace in their lives. The Webster definition of peace is a mental calm, tranquility, in a quiet place, or free from war, or, or the definitions there. Satan does his best to keep you in spiritual warfare, warfare uh, so you cannot have the peace of God which passes all understanding. The truth of this matter is that it's up to you to decide how, how much peace you want in your life. You cannot control certain people or certain situations in your life, but you can control how you react to all situations of life. Let's look at what the Bible says about having the peace of God in your life from a familiar text. Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. And when you think about shepherd and how important a shepherd is, uh, to someone who owns sheep, uh, the the sheep are totally dependent on the shepherd. All right, uh, it, it's it's just a must. There, uh, you have to trust the shepherd, and you have to realize that the shepherd's there to watch over them. Uh, the shepherd's there to uh, you know see what's best for them. And sheep are just such a tame and mild animal. Okay, they don't really get riled uh, except when they are being attacked, and uh, they have basically nothing to defend themselves with. Uh, so he is comparing, uh, you know, the the Lord who who is God of this heaven uh, is our shepherd. And the next verse is, "I shall not want." Okay, and when you think of Jehovah Jireh. Uh, that is one of the names of God. Uh, it, it literally means the Lord will provide. Just as the shepherd provides for the sheep, God provides for us. And we need to remember that. And you think about sheep, and uh, I just jotted down what a sheep needs. Uh, they need food, they need shelter, they need water, and they need rest. And then I got to thinking, well, what does people need? People need food, shelter, water, rest, and I added clothing, <laughs> all right? A sheep has their own clothing, okay? Uh, their clothing is what they wear, and it is a protection uh, for them. So there's some comparison there, even the spiritual side of God being our shepherd and literal sheep. Hold your fingers there and go to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4. Philippians 4, verse 10. 
And remember what we said, the second, the second part of verse 1, I shall not want. And here's what you have to understand. There's a difference in wanting somewhat, something and needing something. Okay? Needing things were these things that we mentioned. Food is one of the things we need. Now, the, the amounts of food, that, that, that's negotiable there, all right? But we all cannot survive without food and water. You have to have those things. So that is a need. And then we go to wants. And that's where a lot of times, you know, you know it separates itself, the need from a want. Uh, Philippians 4, look at verse 10. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly, now that at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Which basically meant, you know, the Philippian church was uh, taking care of Paul, but something happened to where they, he couldn't, uh, you know, count on them, or uh, they couldn't do exactly what they did. And, and, and folks, you have to understand, uh, you know, Paul's, Paul's supply comes from God, and at this time, it was through the church. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned whatever state I am to be content. And folks, here's the first key to peace, okay? It is contentment, all right? Now, what is contentment? It is being satisfied with where you are and what you have. Contentment is being satisfied with where you are and what you have. And folks, there are a lot of people in life that are not content. They are always looking for more. They are always trying. And, and I heard a man uh, one time uh, that had quite a bit of money in Lawton, and uh, somebody asked him, he said, how much is enough? And he said, just another million. Okay, and I'm thinking, well, I don't even know how to spell million, you know, in my life. And so you can see the difference in being content and not content. And folks, people, think about this. People tend to focus on what they don't have instead of what they do have. And, you know, happiness, you, you know, you can buy some happiness, but you can't, you can't buy peace and you can't buy joy. That comes from the Lord, okay? So we, one of the keys there is to realize that money is not going to make you happy. It doesn't buy, uh, you know, joy in your life. So we as Christians need to learn to be content in what, what we do. Now, verse 12 in Philippians chapter 4, it says, I know how to be abased, and I know how to be abound. Abased is poor, and... You know, the more I thought of it as I grew up, uh, we didn't have a lot of money when, we, when, we, when I was growing up. But you know what we had? Uh, my father met every need that we had. Okay, we didn't have a big home. We, for six people, we had a small home. You know, I didn't have 12 pairs of shoes. You, you go in my closet right now, I have 12 pairs of probably dress shoes. And I, we basically kept two kinds of shoes. I had tennis shoes to go to school in, and I had dress shoes to go to church in. That's what I had. And at Christmas, you know what, you know what we had in the stocking? We had an apple, an orange, and nuts. Okay? And, and the cool thing about nuts was you got to crack those, all right? So what I'm saying is, when I look back on my life, and I lived at 27, 21i in, in Lawton, Oklahoma, we had everything we need, okay? But so many people don't understand if you can't be happy without, you probably won't be happy with, okay? Being content. Verse 12, I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I've learned both to be full and to be hungry. And folks, I, I'm just saying, you know, we don't have to have a lot of money. We don't have to be full to be content. We just need to be satisfied with what God gives us. And then I love verse 13. Uh, this is a great verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now go down to verse 19. And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Folks, I am telling you, 
Uh, God has taken care of me. God has taken care of my family. I owe everything to God. I owe who I am, where I live, what I am doing, everything. And I am telling you, uh, you know, I said this to one of my shut-ins today. I said, if I died today, I am telling you, I would be one happy man. Now, I don't have a death wish. Now, I do want to go to heaven, and I want to get there, you know, soon, <laughs> all right? But I'm simply saying, God has been so... Matter of fact, if you think about it, if you have salvation, you have everything. You have everything. They can take away my car. They can take away my house. They can take away a lot of stuff, but they cannot take away my salvation. My God shall supply all our needs. And that's provision, folks. Provision is not worrying about things. And I know this is hard. I talked to uh, somebody just a few weeks ago, and they just said, I can't help worrying. And I said, yes, you can. All right? Matter of fact, uh, Matthew tells us, do not worry. Okay, why? Because God's going to take care of you. Just as a shepherd takes care of a sheep, God's going to take care of you. Now, we may not have everything we want, but we have everything we need, and we have Jehovah God of this Bible watching over us. Matthew 6. I know you know this verse, but I want you to look at it. Matthew 6, verse 33. Here's how to be content. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Folks, I am telling you, when you are seeking God, when you are pleasing God, when you are obeying God, doesn't mean you're going to be rich. That's not what it's talking about. It's saying God will take care of you. Now look at the, now look at the second part, verse 34. Therefore, do not worry. Four times in this chapter, it tells us, do not worry. If it told us one time, that would be enough. But it tells us, as Christians, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient is the day of the day, is its own, for the day is its own trouble. And I think some people almost look for bad things to happen. They almost say, and I hear them say phrases like, well, if it can happen, it can sure happen to me. Folks, we shouldn't have that outlook. We have to understand that everything, uh, matter of fact, the Bible says in, in, in Psalms, you know, the steps of a righteous man are, 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 for, are, are given from God. And we can't always take the good and not understand it's even, and I, I've said this many times, folks, I grow more when I'm struggling than I am when I'm just, you know, uh, you know just happy and everything's falling in place. I trust God more through troubles. I lean on God more. I get closer to God more when challenging situations come into my life. So, folks, there's some things you, you shouldn't worry about because you can't change things, okay? And that's what it means here. That's provisional peace. God will take care of you. God is watching over you. Now, look in the rest of that verse. Verse 2, back in Psalm 23. He makes me lie down in green pasture. And we know the pastures. Okay, green, that's the feeding. Okay, God feeds and takes care of us. He leads me beside the still waters. And you know, peace comes from God. Matter of fact, Jehovah Shalom is the word for peace. And I don't know about you, just like today, I mean, I go out of my house and the wind just about knocks me over. And especially if you're on a lake and you're in a boat, you want calm waters, all right? And there's just something about that. It just looks tranquil, all right? It is just so peaceful to look over and see a body of water. Steve told me when they were on vacation, number one is they liked to froze to death while they were down there on spring break. The second thing is he had never seen the ocean that calm. He said, Mike, two days, literally, you look out there, and there wasn't a ripple in the water hardly. And there's something about that. And folks, I am telling you, God is the thing that, 
that brings us peace. God is the thing that takes us to those still waters. Yes, we're going to have some storms in life, but the very the, the very Jesus that we serve, remember what he said when that storm was going on? And one time he, he literally said, what? Peace, be still. And boom, it just was still. And folks, the key to peace is staying close to God in Jesus. That's the key. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul, okay? Uh, you know, there are times of restoration, there's times when God is allowing things into our lives. And it's just like all these TV shows. Lori watches all these TV shows on how to restore houses, how to restore things. And, you know, I go through there and there's all these things going on. And some of them, I, I will say it's amazing. They take something that looks like a piece of junk or dump and makes it into a $250,000 or $300,000 home. Folks, that's a, that's a, perfect deal about restoring our soul. Folks, God wants our soul to have peace. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesakes. And folks, when you stay on the path, that narrow way, when you do not veer off to the left and veer off to the right, you can find that peace in your life. So we see in the first three verses, provisional peace. The second thing I want you to see is personal peace. Personal peace. Verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And when you look at this, the, uh, you know, walking through the valley of the shadow of death, uh, one thing about valleys, all right, to have a valley, there must be mountaintops. All right, and we we can't always as Christians live on the mountaintops, okay? And there are people, you know, that you just think, well, they're they're probably never down. They they never hit those valleys. And if you look at the Word of God, and you can even look in the Old Testament and see prophets of God, okay? I mean, even Elijah, after he, you know, on Mount Carmel did his thing, he got to running away from Jezebel, and he got in one of those valleys. He was running and he was tired and he was scared and she threatened his life and he, he pretty much said, God, just take me right now. Okay, that's the valley that folks get in, all right? But folks, the key is not that we won't sometime get in the valley. The key is we don't need to stay there. We need to realize that God is with us, all right? And we remember God uh, fed him and God took care of him. He told him to eat and to strengthen himself because he still had ministry to do. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, in the number one thing I have seen every, every survey, everything that I see, the number one fear in human life is death. And when you think about it, folks, we as Christians should not fear death, Okay. I call it graduation day. I call it to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And we have to realize what scares the world. Death scares the world. And you have to understand that to a Christian, we should have a totally different outlook on death. And I've done, I couldn't even tell you how many funerals I've done in 43 years. But it's those funerals where this wailing and this gnashing of teeth and this just totally people are just you know just totally upset can't hardly talk can't do anything all right those are the people seem to have no hope but i like the the funerals to where the the person's life literally preaches their own funeral because they're at peace with god they're at peace with their fellow man we understand you know, that, you know, if, if the Lord tarries, folks, we are going to have physical deaths. Nobody lives forever here on earth. I guess maybe 113 was the oldest uh, or somewhere around there. But, but you still die, and we should not fear death. And that's what personal peace is. Let me put it this way. To live life, you must first take care of that question 
of death. Where am I going? Well, I know where I'm going. I'm going to heaven. So why should I fear? Why should I fear that? All right, and again, I don't have a death wish. I love my job. I love my family. I love my wife. I love what I do every day. And I can honestly say, folks, in 20 years, not one morning have I got up and I was fixing to go to work and said, I don't want to go to work today. Now, every once in a while, when it's 80 degrees and it's calm and it's Friday, all right, I want to go on my motorcycle. Why? Because I have peace and contentment on my motorcycle. And that's what he's saying. God will give you, it's just like the, the thing that bothers people more than anything. Preacher, you're going to get killed on that thing. All right. I mean, I could not tell you how many people have said that. Well, folks, I believe in the divine uh, will of God. All right. Not that he will will me to die, but folks, he, I have a guardian angel. I'm very careful. I've been riding motorcycles since I was six years old. I got a mini bike for Christmas when I was six years old. And it can happen. But I am just telling you, folks, when that day comes, not on a motorcycle, I really, I'm just simply saying we should not fear death. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, go with me. 1 Corinthians 15. I love this whole chapter. This whole chapter is totally awesome. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Haiti swears the victory. The sting, the, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks, to, thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, if there's a hymn that I want sung at my funeral, it is victory in Jesus. Folks, I'm having victory, okay? I want it to be a time of celebration. I want it to be a time of, of just, you know, you know, realizing that, man, he is with the Lord. Look at verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the, the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So he tells us again, be steadfast, immovable, abounding. Folks, Christians are the happiest and have the most joy when they are serving the Lord. I don't know about you, but I really do, folks. I love to sub, serve the Lord. All right, I, you, know, I, you know, I love to preach the Word. I really do. But being out in the fields, I, I, I study every morning uh, that I come to work. I study uh, for the first four hours. And then in the afternoon, sometimes that'll spill over to the afternoon. But in the afternoon, you know, we are, we are you know, ministering to our people. And there's just that fulfillment, knowing that you encourage somebody in the faith. So we don't have to be afraid of death. And not having fear brings us much peace, much peace. Look at the second part of verse 4. For you are with, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And you know another thing about fear? Another thing we have about fear is, folks, uh, I read a stat one time that said 72% of everything you worry about or fear never comes true. So you have to realize three-fourths of the time, it's not going to come true anyway. And where does fear come? We know where fear comes. It comes from Satan, all right? So do not, do not fear. Do not even fear death. The worst thing people think can happen to you, we should not fear. Now look at the second part. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Folks, comfort is giving us peace. Giving us peace. That peace that passes all understanding. Paul said it like this in Philippians. Go with me to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians 1. Verse 21, Philippians 1, 21. For me, to, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Man, that needs to be one of our life verses, folks. All right? For me to live is Christ. Everything is about Jesus. My life, my walk, what I do, how I think, where I go, what I listen to, what I watch. 
all ought to be about Jesus and to to die as gain. But if I live in the flesh, this will mean fruit of my labor. Yet uh, I shall choose. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. And basically, what he's saying, man, I get fulfillment out of ministry. I get a fulfillment out of that. But but there's still another thing that when you think about heaven, folks, I, I don't know about you, but the older I get, the more I think about heaven. I don't I don't know if you've come to that point in your life. But I, I even sometimes have dreams about heaven. And, and again, I don't, I don't even call it a vision. I call it a dream. And just think, because our minds cannot figure out, really, truly know what heaven's going to be like. It's going to be wonderful. And here's what he says. For I'm hard-pressed between the two. Here he said, man, I'm, I'm, I'm split. I'm, I'm torn about this. Having a desire to depart and be with Christ which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. Let me tell you when you're going to die. When God says you're going to die. Let me tell you when you're going to die. When God's through with you. Okay? And then, but until then, man, we need to be serving the Lord. Yeah, we all, like I said, we all have that need and we have that one and we have that desire to go to heaven. But we have to keep working for the Lord. And, and folks, that, that working and obeying God and surrender to God and you know selling out to God gives us that peace uh, that passes all understanding. So we can have provisional peace. We can have personal peace. And I love this one. We can have perfect peace. Perfect peace. Look at verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Folks, I am telling you, uh, you know, there's different thoughts on this, you know, God's marriage supper and, and things like that. But I think what he's talking about is that even in the worst times, even when our enemies are after us, God watches over us. He prepares a table. Uh, I always remember my, my uh, granny when we used to go to uh, Amarillo, Texas when I was young and my grandparents lived there. And er we'd go every eight weeks, we would get in the car on a Friday night and uh, we would leave about five o'clock. As soon as my father got off, mom had sandwiches packed and we'd drive all the way to Amarillo. It took about four hours from Lawton. And then on Sundays, we would go to church and we'd go to Martin Road Baptist Church anytime we were in Amarillo, Texas. And we would go to Sunday school. Matter of fact, uh, when we were growing up, the, the youth teacher loved it when he was there because most of the time they had no youth. And there was four of us. And so we'd go to Sunday school, we'd go to church, and then Granny would make fried chicken before we left. And I finally figured out, I finally found out what she did. She soaked her chicken in buttermilk. She'd do it on Saturday night. And I, you talk about the best. And folks, God is preparing a table for us. He is going to give us the best. There's some times in life that we don't think it's the best, and we even, we even say the why word. You know why? But folks, God has a purpose. Uh, he's going to walk through it, those times with us, even when our enemies seem like they are, even, even when you know it seems unfair or somebody's against us and we're innocent and all that. Folks, God is taking care of us. You anoint my head with oil. We're talking about poor, perfect peace here. And I believe here he's talking about healing. And folks, I believe in the healing power of Jesus Christ. Sometimes people aren't healed, and I understand that. But there are times when God answers a prayer, and we just, we just say, wow, that is amazing. And folks, I have experienced this in my own life. I had cancer uh, when I was uh, 30 years old. I, I had two incisions on my shoulder, and I have two skin grafts on my shoulder. And the last time they went down, they said, it's just like a golf hole when we went down there. I went down and took everything out. You can literally feel my bone on my shoulder. And you talk, it took me over a year to get over that. But that's the way God God healed me through surgery. And you know what? I have not had a cancer. I've been checked and checked and checked and checked. 
and God healed me from cancer, and I praise God for that. Now look at the next verse. My cup runneth over. I don't know about you, but I'm telling you, my cup runneth over. One of the things that my grandpa Lopez, they lived in Binger, Oklahoma, he had always pour a cup of coffee, and for some reason, he would pour, he would spill it. I mean, he would let it go over into the... And so, you know, I er, learned early in life, after he finished his cup, he would take that saucer and he'd drink that coffee from that saucer. And what was he trying to do? The very last drop is what he was trying to do. And folks, that, that is a picture of what, what God does for us. He fills our cup up. I mean, we have a song, fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. And we are over flowing with blessings just like burning the note up here folks i mean everywhere i'd tell that to somebody that is not associated with our church they just go that's incredible that's incredible 3.6 million in eight years and we saved over a million dollars all right uh in interest doing that folks that's god filling our cup up and letting it run over Number verse six surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and i will dwell in the house of the lord forever man i love that goodness folks god is so good he is so good to us mercy without mercy and grace when i was lost when i wasn't looking for god he had mercy on my soul. He gave me get grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. I, I found grace. I found God's amazing grace in my life. And it shall uh, follow me all the days of my life. And the last thing is, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Folks, that's heaven. That is heaven. Philippians 4, and I close. Philippians 4. This is great scripture, folks. Philippians 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. You know what music does? Folks, music calms our spirits. Music ministers to our souls. A lot of time, uh, you know, when you have a rough day, or at least I have a very, very busy day, I can put on Christian music and in a matter of two or three songs, Man, my soul is just calmed down, and, and I have that peace. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Look at verse 6. Be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about anything. Folks, God has got this. He's got it. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Prayer gives us peace prayer praying about things asking god to bless things asking god god show me your will show me the path that i need that gives us peace and look at this and the peace of god which passes all understanding will guard our hearts and minds through christ jesus folks the world does not understand this peace that we have in jesus christ and you think about it, you know, you know, Ukraine, Israel, Hamas, all that. What is all that? That's war, folks. That is war. And, and again, you know, I don't think there's going to be peace in the Middle East until the Prince of Peace comes again. And then it says, uh, finally, brethren, verse 8, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, Whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good or, or a good report, if there be any virtue and if there be anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Look at this true, noble, just, pure, lovely. What are those? That's all characteristics of the Christian life. It bleeds over even into the fruits of the spirits. And folks, we need these things in our lives to have peace. The heart belongs to God and Jesus. 
But that battle is in the mind. And Satan will do his best to spill, you know, just garbage in your life to help you think of how bad things are. But folks, we can get that peace from God. Verse 9, the things which you have learned and you received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Folks, we have to trust God. We have to understand, you know, uh, you know meditation is, is not just reading a scripture, it's meditating on it. It's reading it a second time and reading it the third time and just, just letting that scripture flow over us. That's why it's Psalm, I mean, you think of Psalm 23, it is the most quoted Psalm. All right, John 3.16 is the number one verse in all the Bible that people can quote. But when it comes to a chapter, it is Psalm 23. And what is that? A Psalm is a song, a song. So when you have had a rough day, all right, when, when you are hurting, we have, to, we have to go to God in prayer. We have to put on some Christian music. We have to just tune everything out. And I tell you the other thing that steals our peace from us is watching TV, all right? I get where I rarely, I, I watch 30 minutes of the local news, but the rest of it, folks, I'm just telling you, it will rile you up and, and it's, just, it's just not good for us. We, we tend to focus on the wrong thing. So folks, we, we all need peace in our life. And I thank God that we serve the God of peace. Father, thank you for this day. And God, I thank you that you give us provisional peace. God, you take care of us. You really do. We, we get m much more than we deserve. And God, thank you for personal peace. God, there's no doubt in my mind when I die, I'm going to heaven. I have no fear of death, and I just can't wait to get there and see relatives, and especially my mom and dad. I just can't wait to, to get there. And then thank you that we can have perfect peace. Your word says we can have perfect peace. So God, I pray that we pursue that. I thank you for your goodness and mercy. And God, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for Christian music. Thank you for the peace that only comes from you. So God, I pray that we would pursue peace. God, it just doesn't come automatically. Lord, we have to have discipline in our lives and we have to put the right things in our minds and in our hearts. And so God, I pray that you give everyone here and everyone that's listening, God, I pray we could have that peace that passes all understanding. We, we lay our head on the pillow at night. We just go right to sleep because the peace that you have given us. Thank you that there is victory in Jesus. In your name I pray these things. Amen.